All right, let me just make sure all of our streaming is set up. And then we will start our introduction here. A couple of people are still joining us in the Zoom call too, so I'll give them a chance to pop on. Hi, Jerry. Hey, hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Well, I'm excited. Are you going to do any fire, fire, fire flow tonight? Or Not tonight, be... no. Okay. <laughs> That's a that different show. an interesting way to start this. <laughs> or end. End with a bang, right? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> So it looks like we should have almost everybody that at least RSVP'd for Zoom. And if we have anybody join in, I'll just add them later. So we're going to go ahead and get started since it's about six o'clock. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Parks. I'm the Programming and Events Manager at the St. Joseph Museum. And I want to welcome Dr. Christine Seamer today with us. And let me pull up I have a lovely biography written about her. So Christine is a professor of psychology at Missouri Western State University. She's been interested in the therapeutic possibilities of psychedelic substances for the last decade. She has been a conference volunteer for MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, and has completed the Zendo Project's training for psychedelic harm reduction. Recently, she's taught the honors colloquium at Missouri Western entitled Psychedelic Science, Exploring the New Frontier of Psychedelics as Medicine for the Mind. This talk will be a brief summary of those topics discussed in that class. So a little more um, logistics here. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Christine, and I'm going to ask everybody to, so we can see her screen fully um, and better on our screens, to um, undo your video and mute yourself for now. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to come back on um, video and unmuted um, to ask any questions. Um, or if you want to go ahead and just write them in the chat, don't want to come on, that's totally fine. I can read those also, um, as I'm going to be doing that for our Facebook Live friends. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass the presentation over. All right, cool. I'm going to share my screen here. All right, is everybody able to see the presentation? I can't see you anymore, so hopefully you can. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so like, like uh, my lovely introducer here said, I'm Christine Ziemer. Um, Missouri Western State University is where I teach psychology. Um, and I'm really excited to be here talking to you today about this really interesting topic in psychology recently, which is psychedelics. So for the talk today, I'm gonna to start off just talking about what psychedelics are, um, what qualifies as a psychedelic, and then I'll shift and talk about what they do, um, how, what types of effects they have, how they work with the brain, a little bit of that, and then get into how they have potential for healing. Um, and we'll end up talking a, a bit about psychedelic policy and where we are today. So to start off psychedelics, what are they? Um, so I love this quote from Humphrey Osmond, fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. Humphrey Osmond actually coined the term psychedelic 
Uh, and before that, you know, they tried different terms like psychomimetic, um, but psychedelic really encompasses what these groups of compounds are. They're not necessarily good or bad. They really manifest whatever is in your mind and in the environment. And so that's what this term means, mind manifesting. So psychedelic means uh, to manifest what's in your mind or in your soul, depending on how you translate that psyche. Um, so the, the definition is here, but it, it's hard to define. It, it's not like a type of drugs like stimulants or depressants um, because it has a wide range of action in the brain. The commonality is that it brings about these uh, mind manifesting experiences that can increase empathy, increase feelings of connection. You can have, you know, perceptual distortions, um, like some of us might call to mind from the 60s, um, sort of tie dye and, and psychedelic uh, images, uh, and that can be part of it. But the, the part that's more healing is the transpersonal or mystical or spirit, spiritual experiences that can be uh, had under the influence of these compounds and the increased int introspection and connection and empathy as well. So there's the classic psychedelics um, that have a similar action in the brain and that they affect the serotonin system and specifically the 5-HT2A serotonin receptors. So this, in this category, we have things like LSD, acid, psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, mescaline from peyote, and dimethyltryptamine or DMT. Um, but other compounds are also sometimes grouped in this category of psychedelics because they can elicit these psychedelic type effects, these uh, trips or, um, you know, the mystical experience. So in that category is uh, methylene dioxymethamphetamine or MDMA or ecstasy, uh, ketamine, uh, ibogaine, and ayahuasca. So I'll talk about each of these just briefly on the next slide. So starting with the classic psychedelics, probably the most famous psychedelic is acid or LSD. This was first discovered in 1938 by Albert Hoffman, but he didn't, um, he first synthesized it in 1938, but he didn't discover the effects until five years later. He had sort of a vision or um, a feeling that he needed to go back and look at this particular, um, this particular uh, chemical that he'd created um, when he was synthesizing ergo um, from a, which is a mold that grows on rye. And he, while he was re-examining it, happened to get a little bit on his hands and noticed a strange um, psychological effect. So the next day on April 19th, 1943, he uh, took 250 micrograms, which a microgram is a millionth of a gram. So just a tiny little bit of this substance and had this just uh, phenomenal trip. So the normal dosage is 25 to 200 micrograms. So he had quite a hefty dose. Uh, he rode his bicycle home. His world was just disintegrating before his eyes. He thought he was going to die. But lo and behold, he woke up the next day and he felt reborn. He felt wonderful. And so he was the first person to have a um, an LSD trip, intentional LSD trip, with no expectations. Um, of what was going to happen. And he then was, became very interested in this compound and uh, under the name Delicid, sent it off to many different psychologists and psychology research labs all over the world um, to look into it further and to see what this really interesting um, compound could be used for. So again, it's just a tiny little bit that uh, la it has an effect that can last uh, six to 10 hours. So it's very powerful. Similar to acid is psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. There's actually about 100 different species of mushrooms that contain psilocybin, so it's not just one specific type of mushroom, and they grow all over the world. However, um, they weren't well known for their psychedelic properties in the United States until 1953 when mycologist R. Gordon Wasson went down to Mexico um, to the home of Maria Sabina, who was a, a mushroom curandera. Um, down there and led in vision quests and healing with the mushrooms. Um, he convinced her to let him, um, you know, try these mushrooms and photograph her and then came back and published in Life magazine. Um, you can see the cover here, a discovery of mushrooms that cause strange visions. And that's when um, the Western world really got turned on to uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Um, so for that, the, the usual dose for psychedelic experience is one to five grams, and the effects are a little bit shorter than acid. So when we get into the research, you'll see that um, psilocybin and acid have about the same 
type of effect, but in the research lab, psilocybin is usually favored because of that shorter window of action. Um, it makes it a lot more possible to, you know, have somebody come in and have their entire experience and still be able to go home later that night. Um, in the classic psychedelics, we also have mescaline, which is the active ingredient from peyote cactus and also the San Pedro cactus. Um, peyote is uh, endangered. It, it grows um, only in some areas of Texas and Mexico. It's been used by the Native American church for ceremonial purposes um, for generations. And so it has special uh, legal status in the United States on reservations for Native American um, church to use. Um, it can be eaten fresh, dried in a tea, et cetera, um, and lasts about 10 hours. So dimethyltryptamine is a little bit different in this category of classic psychedelics. It's still active on the um, serotonin receptor, um, but it's metabolized in our bodies very quickly. So instead of a an hour trip, it's uh, 15 to 30 minutes. Um, it is actually found in many different plants and animal species throughout the world, uh, including humans. So um, there, it's been found in the brains of animals and in human brains. And a hypothesis about why it's there is that it, it may be released by the pineal gland um, to create these endogenous or spontaneous spiritual experiences that we have perhaps during birth and during death. Um, so it's a very powerful out-of-body experience. Um, you have less control over what's going on than you do with some of the other classic psychedelics. And I'm speaking really fast. I have a lot of slides to get through, so I apologize um, if, if this is going too, too quickly. Um, Okay, so MDMA, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, which is a really fun word to say. Um, you may have heard of it called ecstasy or molly. Um, it is now we're into the other psychedelics. So it's a little different than the classic psychedelics. It's technically a stimulant. Um, and, but what it creates is this really interesting effect in the brain that, that creates empathy. So it's also sometimes called an empathogen. Um, it was created by a pharmaceutical lab, but really popularized by Alexander Sasha Shulgin, a Berkeley chemist who synthesized it in his um, backyard laboratory. And then, um, you know, was able to distribute it to therapists and psychologists um, in the area and publish scientific articles, articles on its effects. Um, in the 60s and 70s, um, it was widely used um, by therapists as a marriage counseling drug um, because it does create this sense of empathy. It increases serotonin in the brain and um, stimulates the production of oxytocin, which is the love hormone, the same hormone that's released when you give birth or breastfeeding or have an orgasm. Um, so it's really great for bonding. And so couples who were having marital crisis would come in and talk to their counselor. They would take some MDMA together and work through their problems in a very open-minded and empathetic headspace. So it was very popular and very successful. Um, today it is, um, on the last phase of clinic, clinic, clinical trials um, for FDA approval to uh, for treating uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So it also has a really unique potential to allow people to go into um, their trauma memories and with love and empathy sort of remap those pathways um, and promote healing. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Ketamine is another interesting one. So this is actually uses an anesthetic. It's um, of the whole list. It's the only one that's uh, not schedule one. This is schedule three. And it is, so it's legally used in the medical world as an anesthetic. And it's also being legally used now prescribed off-label for depression, um, even addiction and some other things. Um, and it does seem to have some promise of, you know, the same type of psychedelic treatment that it can create these psychedelic effects. Um, promote uh, transpersonal healing experiences um, the, and, and give people relief from depression or suicidal thoughts. Um, so it's recently been approved as a nasal spray by the FDA. It can be injected, there's lozenges. And so there are ketamine clinics um, already in every state in, in the US, I believe that um, you can go and get psychedelic therapy today um, legally. Uh, it's just, uh, there's a lot of variability in the type of care that these different ketamine clinics that are popping up give. Some are just, you know, give you the injection and leave you alone. Others are intense therapy and the ketamine is sort of a therapy lubricant. So because it's sort of a gray area, 
um, in the field, there, there's push to sort of make some more protocols and, and do more research on ketamine for psychedelic therapy, but it is out there being used. So it, it may serve as a model for future um, psychedelic therapy. Ibogaine is a, a psychedelic root, uh, part of the plant, that, the Tabernath Avoga plant from Africa. Um, and in high doses, it does have a psychedelic effect. Um, it lasts for several, it can last for several days. So it's not something to be taken lightly, um, but it, it has a great potential for um, addiction treatment, um, specifically opioid uh, opiate addiction, um, because it works at the opiate receptors. It's been called an addiction interrupter. So it doesn't cure addiction, but what it does is it can stop the chemical addiction part, sort of put, a, put the brakes on that. So somebody who's having um, a, a chemical addiction to uh, heroin or opioids um, goes through the ibogaine ceremony and comes out basically skipping the withdrawal symptoms. So instead of having the cravings and the physical discomfort of withdrawal, um, you're basically just free of that. Um, so it gives you this window to then, you know, work with a therapist to try to overcome the addiction. Um, we know that addiction is um, not just a chemical dependence. Modern research has shown that it's it's really um, goes in the, in the sort of the pattern of your behavior and sociocultural influences um, and trauma a lot of the times at the root of it. So, um, you know, stopping the chemical dependence is one thing, but then going in and sort of trying to figure out, you know, what other things need to be fixed to um, stop the addiction for good. But Ibogaine is, is a great um, tool that might be helpful for that. And similarly, ayahuasca. So this is from um, Central and South America. Again, taking those plants that contain the DMT that we talked about that's metabolized really quickly, but combining it with a vine that has a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, MAOI. And what that does is it slows down the metabolism of the DMT. So instead of this 15 or 30 minute trip, you have a 12 hour experience. Um, and these are also used in ceremonies, also really um, good for addiction treatment and other types of healing. Um, interestingly, both ayahuasca and ibogaine are Schedule I um, in the United States, um, although they've never been drugs of abuse. These are not fun party drugs to take. They are often very um, discomforting. You, a lot of times people will start off their trip by purging, either throwing up or having diarrhea. Um, the experiences can be really dark and sort of in, encountering your shadow. Um, but like good therapy, they do, you know, they do come out um, feeling better and lighter in the end. Um, so they really are great therapy tools, um, but not something that you would take and go to a concert or something like that. All right. So I want to just briefly put this into context um, with a little timeline. So psychedelic, using psychedelic substances for healing is not new by any stretch of the imagination. As far back as we have human record, cave drawings and markings, um, tombs, we find evidence of psycho, psychoactive plants, um, specifically cannabis, which is I didn't talk about, but is also sometimes grouped in, in psychedelics. And we did talk about it in the class quite a bit as well, um, but also um, psychedelic mushrooms. So when we look at ancient religions, we also see the imprint of psychoactive plants in a lot of different rituals and ceremonies. One great example um, that's talked about in, in a new book that came out, The Immort Immortality Key, is ancient Greece, uh, the Eleusinian mystery rites. These were ceremonies held from 1600 BC to 392 CE. So for hundreds of years, people like Plato and Socrates would go and take part in these ceremonies. Um, and during the ceremonies, uh, they said that people came out trans significantly transformed and no longer fearing death. Um, they drank a brew called kaikion, which um, researchers say was a mint barley brew, but it also um, probably contained some of that um, ergo fungus from the wheat, which, if you remember, was what was used to synthesize LSD. So there's reason to believe that there were psychoactive substances being consumed in these ceremonies, which um, you know was birthing these new ideas and new civilizations. Research in the Western world with psychedelics really kicked off with that discovery of LSD in 1943. Um, like I said, Albert Hoffman uh, sent out samples of this new substance to lots of different psychology labs, therapists, and researchers. 
and really kicked off um, the first wave of psychedelic research and psychedelic therapy. Um, in Canada, there was a, a, a great uh, group of people studying psychedelics um, and doing research and therapy. Um, this is Humphrey Osmond and Abram, Ho Abram Hoffer, two of the uh, men that were highly involved in the Canadian lab. And um, apart from coining the term psychedelic, um, like I said, at first, psychomimetic was the um, term, the working term for a while, because the first hypothesis, what psychologists thought they could do with this drug is that they thought it mimicked psychosis. So they thought, oh, cool, I can take this substance and understand what it's like to be schizophrenic. And I can then relate better to my patients with schizophrenia. Um, and so that was sort of the working hypothesis for a while. Um, after working with this, this compound more, they discovered it wasn't quite the same thing and started to uh, realize it was manifesting whatever was in your mind and hence the, the term psychedelic. Uh, but uh, their main work they're, they're most famous for is work with um, alcoholics and um, trying to cure alcoholism. Um, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous was actually one of uh, the patients of this Canadian psychedelic research back in the 50s. And he um, credits his LSD experience to helping form the 12-step program. So it was really instrumental. They were having some good success with um, helping people um, break out of alcohol addiction. I'm Sasha Shulgin who is sometimes known as the godfather of MDMA. This is the Berkeley chemist who synthesized and popularized um, the drug in the 60s and 70s. Um, one of the people he shared MDMA with is Leo Zeff, who um, was one of the most well-known um, MDMA therapists at the time and really worked with that substance quite a bit um, with patients and developed some protocols for therapists. Of course, we got to talk about the famous uh, Harvard team of Timothy Leary and, and Richard Al Alpert, who then became Ramdas. Um, they were at Harvard, became really interested in this movement, started the Harvard Psilocybin Project, um, but were subsequently fired from Harvard around 1963 um, for just their exuberance about the project and, and sharing uh, substances with, with students. Um, and it started to threaten the authority. And this was sort of the first sign that this psychedelic research was, was starting to threaten the, the powers that be, the status quo. It started to leak out of the laboratory and be used by the counterculture, which was then starting to um, you know, fight for things like uh, women's rights and, and African-American rights and fighting the Vietnam War. And so it was a really changing world. And this was adding, psychedelics were adding fuel to the fire. Um, a student of Leary and Alpert's, Walter Pankey, um, had one of the most famous studies uh, from the first wave, which was uh, it's known as the Good Friday Experiment or the Miracle at Marsh Chapel. Uh, he had a bunch of seminary students, and this was the first double blind study. He had half of them take, psych uh, take psilocybin and half of them take uh, active placebo, and then they went to the Good Friday service. Afterwards, uh, when interviewing them, um, found that the, the students who had taken the psilocybin had had very spiritual, mystical experiences. Um, of course, the double blind, meaning the people who take it don't know if they're getting the placebo or not, and the people observing don't know if they're getting the placebo or not. That double blind was a little bit broken because it became very apparent early on in the study who had had the psilocybin and who had had um, the placebo just by the way um, the students were, were acting. So after all of this research and all of these laboratories were having great success in therapy, like I said, the fact that it started to leak out into the counterculture um, for various reasons, some just unknown fear of the unknown and, and dangerous things that could happen with these very powerful substances being used in all different types of contexts and partially for political reasons, um, the government cracked down on um, many types of substances um, in 1971, Nixon declared a war on drugs. Um, he actually called Timothy Leary the most dangerous man in America. And so although I'm focusing on US policy, um, it's, it's true that the, the drug policy here really does have a big influence on drug policy in a lot of other places in the world um, where we sort of force our, um, our way of thinking about substances on the other countries by whether we give them aid and, and so on. So I'm mainly just focusing on, on where we are here at the US. So with that war on drugs, we had a long 
blackout of research. Um, funding, federal funding for research dried up. Um, it became not popular to be a psychedelic researcher, a psychedelic therapist. It became illegal and dangerous to be doing these things. And so little by little, all of the research stopped. People who had built, you know, successful careers on psychedelic research sort of saw their uh, line of work crumble before their eyes. Um, and so we had a few decades of, of no psychedelic research. Um, and really two people I credit for you know, bringing, starting to bring this back. The first one is Rick Doblin, who after MDMA, which was the last of the psychedelics to, um, of those classic psychedelic, or within the psychedelic category to uh, become illegal, um, was made illegal. He started, he was a graduate student in psychology and really saw the, the potential for MDMA for therapy. And so he started MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and started raising funds to support uh, psychedelic research and psychedelic policy change. Um, so he's since raised millions of dollars. Um, the organization has grown tremendously. They host conferences, they have a journal, and they are uh, leading the charge on um, therapeutic legalization of MDMA for um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and are in uh, clinic, clinical uh, phase three trials right now, which I'll talk about later. The other person is Rick Straussman, who got through a lot of red tape to uh, do some research on DMT in the early 90s. Um, this dimethyltryptamine, again, classic psychedelic, it was less known, so it had less baggage than uh, things like LSD and psilocybin. Um, and he did some interesting studies just trying to figure out what different effects different doses have on, on human consciousness. And then we have, that really opened up the doors for the psychedelic renaissance. Um, so I'm, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the characters that have been doing psychedelic research, um, some of the students of Leary and Alpert who have gone on to start transpersonal universities and, and write books, Ralph Metzner, James Fadiman, Stan Groff, who was a Czech researcher um, interested in LSD research. Once prohibition happened in the war on drugs, he um, shifted his focus and developed a breathing technique, holotropic breathwork that creates a psychedelic state. So he uh, then continued his psychedelic therapy using and psychedelic research using um, this breathwork instead of um, LSD once it was made illegal. Uh, Charles Grob at UCLA and uh, Dave Nichols at Purdue started, they both are active in um, psychedelic research and started the Hefter Institute named after Arthur Hefter, who was um, the first to synthesize mescaline. And um, yeah, so they're very active. We have uh, Bill Richards, who was again, part of the first wave and now working in psychedelic therapy at John Hopkins. Um, here in the middle, Alicia Danforth is doing uh, work with um, patients with autism with psychedelics. Um, Ali Fiducia and Robin Carhart Harris are psychedelic neuroscientists studying the effects on the brain. Monica Williams is a Canadian researcher looking at how psychedelics can heal racial trauma. Um, Amanda Felding is uh, a countess um, who is really passionate about psychedelic research and started the Beckley Foundation to fund psychedelic research. Roland Griffiths is a big time researcher at John Hopkins running the first ever psychedelic research lab that is affiliated with John, John Hopkins. David Nutt, neuroscientist at Imperial College London. And um, then uh, Annie and Michael Mithoffer, who are psychedelic therapists, they're training the next wave of uh, psychedelic therapists um, to uh, treat a whole host of different mental illness. So <laughs> that was really quick. And there's a, there's a lot more people that aren't mentioned here, um, but just to give you an idea of um, all, some of the names and faces that are associated with the psychedelic renaissance. Okay, so now we know what they are. What do they do? What kinds of effects do they have? I love this quote. These substances can be perceived as existential medicines. They address the heart of the existential crisis, which is a loss of sense of purpose and a meaning of life. So really at the heart of a lot of different mental illness, whether it's depression or trauma or anxiety um, or eating disorders, there's, there's some sort of existential disruption or crisis or a uh, lost lost sense of meaning. And so having these spiritual connecting experiences can be really healing. 
Um, and in the psychedelic research, we find that the more powerful somebody has a mystical experience, um, which again is that, that out of body, that ineffability, they can't quite put it into words. It's more real than real. Um, the more powerful that type of experience, the, the greater outcomes they have, less anxiety, improved mood, improve, improved quality of life. These experiences seem to be really innately healing. And this is a part of this new branch of psychology called transpersonal psychology. Um, trans meaning beyond or across, personal the self or sense of self or ego. And then of course, psychology, the scientific study of the brain and behavior. So this is looking at studying humans potential and humans longingness to, to alter our consciousness, to shift out of this normal status quo sense of self and um, inner monologue and to connect to something greater, connect to the divine, be inspired, stand in awe, um, create community and connection. And through these uh, mystical states and these altered conscious states, um, we access um, the inner healer, um, the, the ability for our body to heal itself and, and to move towards wellness. And that's sort of the idea of transpersonal psychology. Um, and transpersonal experiences can be natural, things like birth, death, um, dreaming is an altered state of consciousness, especially lucid dreaming. Um, and they can be intentional. So uh, things like meditation, controlling your breath and psychedelics. So the reason psychedelics are so interesting to transpersonal researchers is that um, it's something that we can control. It's hard to reliably give somebody an experience of awe. You might have that experience when you look out at the starry sky or the ocean or watch a sunset, um, but it's a little less easy to pin down and predict. Um, but if you bring somebody into a laboratory and give them a high dose of uh, psilocybin mushroom, um, you can reliably predict that they're going to have one of these very profound experiences. And so then you're able to do things like put them in a brain scanner or, you know, uh, work with them therapeutically um, to see what's, how we can access that, that these healing states of consciousness. So that's exactly what Roland Griffiths did in um, his seminal 2006 paper, Psilocybin Can Occasion Mystical Type Experiences. Um, he had healthy volunteers um, take psilocybin and then um, report on their experience. And 80% um, of these people said that the experience with psilocybin was one of the top five most personally meaningful and spiritually significant event of their lives. And coming back years later, that uh, was still um, how they felt. So they're ranking this up with the birth of a child or a death of a parent as one of the most transformative and meaningful experiences of their lives. That's pretty amazing that you can reliably create that type of experience um, using these substances. So what's going on in the brain? There's still a lot that we don't totally understand. And again, different substances are going to affect uh, the brain in slightly different ways. But in general, um, one theory is that it's really decreasing the activity in what we call the default mode network or DMN. And this is the system of brain structures that is active when we are thinking about ourselves, when we're ruminating about the past, thinking about the future. If you've ever tried to meditate and try to quiet down your mind um, and not and just be present. And these thoughts keep coming up like, did I do the laundry? Did I water the plants? Where do I have to go after this? What did I, how did that conversation go yesterday? Is that person mad at me? What am I going to have for dinner? All these thoughts about the past and thoughts about the future and thoughts about self that just keep kind of popping up. That's our default mode network. So in meditation, we're practicing to quiet that voice, quiet that monkey mind, and just be present and just focus on our breath or our mantra. Um, psychedelics sort of naturally do that. They put you in the present moment. Um, they, they can have a, what's called ego disillusion. So that sense of self of who you are can just sort of dissolve and you just become sort of one with the universe. Um, what we're seeing inside the brain is that different regions of the brain are showing increased connectivity. So parts of the brain that wouldn't normally be communicating are communicating. So it's allowing you to think in different ways. Um, and it's increasing neuroplasticity, which is our brain's ability to learn and create new connections. So it's really this very open 
um, susceptible childlike state. Uh, I just heard a talk of somebody had a, a theory of um, it's putting you back into a critical, reopening a critical period of development within the brain. Um, so children are able to absorb and learn things um, very deeply and easily. Uh, but once we become adults, we really have a lot of the neural pathways sort of laid down. And that's part of the problem with uh, mental illness like depression or anxiety or, or trauma is that we get these negative patterns that we get stuck in. And it's really hard to break out of that way of thinking. So just sort of level the playing field and increase neuroplasticity and put us back in this childlike state of learning you can see how, especially if you're working with a, a trusted therapist, that you can really do some, some substantial work in that state. Um, MDMA specifically works really well with, with trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder because it decreases our fear response, decreases activity in the amygdala, increases our rational thinking prefrontal cortex response, and our connection to the hippocampus memory, all while uh, bathing the brain in this, this lovely oxytocin. Um, so it's allowing us to go into um, what normally would, figure, would trigger a strong fear response and instead enter that space in love and um, work work on whatever needs to be worked on there. So this is an image from Robin Carhart Harris, again, Imperial College London Center for Psychedelic Research. Um, in this picture, the different colored dots around the edge of the circle represent different brain regions. So you can see with placebo, there's a lot of connections, but they're mostly within the region. So the purple talks to the purple, the yellow talks to the yellow and so on. With psilocybin, it's not that there's necessarily more connections, it's just that the connections are a lot more chaotic. They're just connecting to different parts of the brain, different areas of the brain, like I said, are communicating with parts of the brain that they wouldn't normally communicate with. Um, Carhart Harris calls this increased entropy. And so whenever we introduce entropy or chaos into the system, it allows for new solutions and for creativity and for different ways of thinking. So that's one of the ways that we think that um, psychedelics are working on the brain. Um, what it comes down to for what they're doing is that it's very individual. Uh, your experience is going to be um, based not only on the type of drug that you take and the amount of it that you take, the drug and dose, but your individual um, differences uh, in metabolism, in um, you know, susceptibility to certain uh, disorder. Um, and then really importantly, your set and setting. Um, so your set being your mindset, your intention, your state of mind going into the experience, and your setting being your physical environment. So because these are manifesting what's in your mind, if you go into the experience and you feel, you know, calm, um, happy, ready to, you know, brave, ready to face whatever it is that comes up, and you feel that you are in a comfortable and safe setting with people that you trust, you're more likely to have a really positive and healing experience. However, if you are nervous, paranoid, um, upset, and you go into the substance, into the, into this experience, and you are in a setting where you don't feel safe, um, I should say, or if you're in a setting where you don't feel safe, you're not with people you trust, you're not physically safe, um, you are more likely to have paranoia and scary experiences, what people would call a bad trip or a difficult experience. So I think that was part of the problem with the 60s was that we didn't quite have enough information about set and setting. And sometimes people were taking uh, large doses in places where um, it wasn't very conducive to, um, to open up and have things come to the surface and manifest whatever was in your mind and to hold that, con to contain that. Um, but when you do have these experiences in, in a controlled environment, like these clinical trials, the therapeutic settings, um, or in a place where you feel safe with a um, trusted sitter um, and access to, you know, a, a quiet place and water and whatever you might need over the course of 10 hours, um, then, then there's very little potential for it to be, um, you know, a, a too terrible of an experience. So how can they heal? And uh, so psychedelic assisted therapy, I've sort of been talking about this a little bit here and there, um, but let's get into what exactly it is. Um, it's using psychedelics, and again, they can be used in different ways to do this, but to, the goal is to facilitate um, healing in combination with psychotherapy. 
So traditional model for treating mental illness today, um, most of the time, if somebody is suffering um, a mental disorder or mental illness that is deviant, dysfunctional, and distressful, something like depression, um, they'll go into a therapist or a psychiatrist and um, talk about it. Oftentimes, there will be a prescription for um, some sort of antidepressant or anti-anxiety um, medicine that will go along with the therapy or maybe just take the medicine and be on your way. Um, the thing with the, the prescriptions, uh, psychoactive substances we have for mental disorders is that they're really just treating the symptoms. They're not doing anything to address the root cause. They're making it very possible for people to, to function and to go about their daily life and to not you know, feel suicidal and um, just stay in bed all day. But because they're just treating the symptoms, it's the sort of thing that you have to continue to keep taking um, sometimes for the rest of your life, right? So um, that's, that's one way to, to manage it. But psychedelics propose a different approach. Um, again, we start with the mental illness, we go to the therapist, and in this case, we work to figure out, you know, what's, what's going on. Then you have um, an intense uh, treatment session where you take the psychedelic substance and you work with your therapist in this mindset. You try to go to the root of the problem. You try to remap um, or, or try to just experience that and, and, and learn different ways of approaching it. Then you go back with the therapist for integration. You work through um, what was encountered during the experience, how you can then integrate that into um, changes in your life um, and incorporate that into the future. And there you go. For a lot of times, you know, we, we hesitate to use the word cure, but it does really seem like after this uh, session or two, um, people tend to feel better. Um, for some cases, like we'll talk about with post-traumatic stress disorder, they no longer qualify as having the disorder anymore um, and can go about their life. So it's a very different model. Um, it's not something that's going to you know, make a lot of money off of people taking drugs for the rest of their life. And not to say that those psychoactive drugs that we have are, are not helpful. They definitely are life-saving and beneficial. They're sort of the best that we have right now. But this is another approach to go in and sort of remap the brain and then not have to keep going back to, um, to the drugs after that. So the three phases of, of that treatment are preparation, the before uh, treatment, and then afterwards integration. During preparation, um, a therapist will have the patient go through medical screening typically to look at if there's any potential underlying factors that might be a health risk um, they can really get the patient in a good mindset by describing to them what to expect, what the experience will be like. Um, patients can set intentions. They're establishing um, a good relationship with the therapist. There may be some more traditional therapy going on as well um, and figuring out what kind of substance and dose to use. Oftentimes, therapists will give uh, patients a set of uh, what's called flight rules. So things like if you see... A, in your experience, a scary monster, don't run away and hide from it, but look at, you know, stand your ground, look it square in the face and say, what do you have to teach me? Um, and so that sort of thing, facing these potentially scary obstacles that may come up, which is again, just mind manifesting, it's coming from you and trying to encounter it with love and see what it's doing there is, is part of the healing. So the treatment session usually is devoting a whole day, um, coming in and you know maybe having some breakfast or a light breakfast, having then having the um, uh, dose given in uh, a capsule so that it can be uh, measured out. And these are in the clinical clinical settings. Um, typically, they've had two therapists because the patient is in this open and vulnerable state. It's better just legally to have two people there. Um, and oftentimes they have been using male female co-therapist team, although they've been experimenting with other combinations. The clinical setting itself needs to be comfortable, right? You don't wanna feel like you're strapped down in a hospital bed that could be really traumatic. Um, so they usually have comfortable couches, chairs, soft lighting. Um, oftentimes, the, depending on the type of therapy and the type of medicine, um, patient is encouraged to go inwards on their trip. And so they may even put on um, eye shades and headphones with a curated playlist of just um, 
sacred music from around the world that's in, trying to encourage that mystical experience. The therapist is just there mainly to support the session. In a lot of these, especially you know, psilocybin and LSD experiences, um, they let the medicine do the work and they're there, you know, if the person needs a glass of water or a hand to hold or help to the bathroom or whatever the case may be. Um, with other types of less intensive uh, psychedelic experiences like MDMA, the therapist may have a more active role of bringing up issues that the patient wants or, wants or needs to talk about um, while in that mindset. And then the real work comes in integration, the days, weeks, and, and even years following the treatment, trying to unpack what that experience was. Um, because without the integration, you know, lots of people have done psychedelics recreationally, and they don't necessarily come away um, with this healed you know, mindset. Um, but being able to go in with that intention of healing, and then afterwards, um, unpack that experience try to figure out how you can put that into context, how you can take what you learned and those feelings that you had and integrate them into your daily life. That's where uh, the real uh, long-term healing comes from. So another thing in integration is assessing the effectiveness of the treatment. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, just a couple of, of the studies that um, have been done. Um, so at John Hopkins, Griffiths et al. has looked at uh, psilocybin for depression and anxiety. And you can see this is the amount of uh, significant response. So decreasing in depression from a low dose versus a high dose, five weeks post-session, um, a high dose of psilocybin showed remarkable remission of that depression, which held up for six months later. So six months after this, they hadn't taken another dose. Um, they're not continually to continuing to take psilocybin, yet the effects of that experience um, held up. And similar with um, anxiety, uh, very similar response. And actually for six months later, they actually showed even less anxiety than um, right after their first dose. Um, so MDMA for PTSD, we're switching to here with this Mitthofer et al. 2010 study. So this is showing um, the amount of PTSD uh, before and after um, psychotherapy with placebo. So there's no active ingredient, no active substance here. Just the psychotherapy alone showed some improvement with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, however, psychotherapy and including MDMA as an active uh, compound, um, the post-traumatic stress disorder decreased um, even, even more so. Um, so that was some of the earlier trials for FDA approval for MDMA. And now we skip forward to 2021, where we're on phase three trials and we see very similar results. Here in the blue, this is the placebo plus therapy. And there is you know, a lot of um, a meaningful response. But if we look at the dark sections, these are people who no longer uh, qualify as PTSD after going through therapy. 32% with just therapy alone no longer qualify as PTSD. They've worked through their trauma, they've healed. Um, but you throw MDMA into the mix and we are at 67% of that population um, now no longer qualifies as having PTSD. So because these are showing such um, really drastically remarkable results, the FDA has labeled um, both MDMA and psilocybin as a breakthrough therapies meaning that uh, they're showing remarkable promise and they are being basically streamlined through the FDA process. Um, a little bit like the COVID vaccines, although not quite that, that fast paced. Um, it's still gonna take years and um, for clinical three, for phase three clinical trials, they need hundreds and hundreds of patients um, at multiple sites. So it's still quite an undertaking, um, but they're uh, kind of, releasing some of the red tape because they realize that there is a mental health crisis going on. This is greatly needed. Um, and to see this type of results coming out of this experimental therapy, um, they're excited about it. They want to see it through. So um, it's really encouraging that that's the state of things for those substances now. Um, the timeline it, from MAPS um, with COVID got pushed a little bit back, but I think they're still planning on 2023 is when they expect full FDA approval for MDMA and then psilocybin to follow shortly after that. So 
these are a short list of some of the disorders that are being looked at and having success treating with psycho psychedelics. So PTSD and depression, also addiction. So opioid addiction, um, smoking cessation, alcoholism, other types of substance abuse, end of life anxiety and pal palliative care are really exciting fields for psychedelics um, because it can give you that near death experience. When people have natural near death experiences, they often come back um, feeling more at peace with the idea of death and less fear. And so psychedelics oftentimes can have that same effect. So especially if you have a terminal diagnosis, being able to live out the rest of your life um, with a peace, a peaceful feeling about death is such a gift. And it's just um, really exciting that that's uh, one of the avenues that's being explored. Um, eating disorders, anxiety, um, helping people with autism have better social function and um, social ease and um, preventing suicide. So where are we for time? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm taking up almost the whole hour here. Um, but just to quickly, a little bit about psychedelic safety um, policy in the future. Um, the short response is that these are relatively very safe uh, with the caveat that we are paying attention to our preparation, our set and setting, um, our dose. Um, they're not addictive, they don't cause dependency, they don't cause any toxicity, um, you can't overdose. Um, so um, in those ways, they're, they're very safe. Um, because they're very powerful um, psychologically, they can sometimes um, create you know, a, a spiritual emergence, something can come up that um, was maybe being buried, um, which is the, the point in therapy, but you don't necessarily want that to just come out if you are say at a concert or something. Um, so that, that does need to be taken into account. There is a risk of it triggering schizophrenia episodes if people have a history of schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenia in their family. Um, and some substances like MDMA can um, sometimes not be suitable for all different if people have a, a heart condition. So it might be something to check with a doctor beforehand. Uh, but I love this chart from uh, David Nutt published in The Lancet in 2010. This is showing um, the danger, which drugs are the most dangerous. And so you can see here, way down at the bottom, we have our um, list of psychedelics, which are not nearly as, as de deadly and dangerous as some of the most widely used legal uh, substances that are available. However, given all that, um, here in the U.S. and um, around the world, we are still uh, looking at these as very dangerous um, substances legally. So they are uh, with the exception of ketamine, Schedule One and Schedule One here in the U.S. means that it has no medical value and high potential for abuse. Um, I think there's a lot of issues with the scheduling system. The fact that cannabis, even though um, more than half the states have uh, legalized it for medical use, is still listed federally as Schedule One, no medical value, um, means that we really have to look at these and that they're not necessarily based on science. Um, the war on drugs is not decreasing drug use, but has had lots of other harms on society. Um, and it, it's, it's blocking the way for more research to be done that could be really healing and offer a lot of relief for a lot of people. Um, in the meantime, not only is it not decreasing drug use, but it's making the drug use less safe. There's more adulterated substances. Um, you can't, it's harder to verify doses. It's harder to have harm reduction tools like drug checking kits to know what you're actually getting. So when you hear about stories about people going to the hospital for things like ecstasy, it probably wasn't pure MDMA. It probably was cut with fentanyl or other substances. Um, and because it's a black market and it's unregulated, um, it's, it's a lot harder for consumers to even know what they're getting. Um, so there's much more we could say about that, but let's just look a little bit about what um, policy around the world. These are some countries that have are leading the way with decriminalization or legalization of um, substances, specifically psychedelics, but other drugs as well. The movement for decriminalized nature in the US has made um, natural substances, so things like fungi, mushrooms, um, ayahuasca, mescaline, uh, legal in um, certain, in, in some of these cities. Oregon, you may have heard recently, um, voted for some really uh, groundbreaking drug policy 
Uh, so ballot measure 110 decriminalized all drugs in the state and 109 legalized psilocybin for therapeutic use. So they're very forward thinking. They see that coming down the pipeline, um, psilocybin is going to be FDA approved and they're already setting the groundwork for having uh, psychedelic therapy in the state. California, it's not passed yet, but they have Senate Bill 519, which would legalize psychedelics for adult use. So basically recreational use over 21 um, for all psychedelics. Um, but that one is, is still, uh, we'll wait to see what happens. And in the US House of Representatives, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez Ocasio um, is working to support psychedelic research um, she has an amendment that she proposed that would allow federal funding for psychedelic research, which is currently, it's blocked. You can't get federal funding for any Schedule I drugs, which makes it really difficult to get the research out there that could um, make some policy changes. Um, the first time she brought it to the floor, it was turned down 91 to 331. Um, she brought it back and recently it was turned down again, but it's gaining momentum. So 140 to 285 was the last vote. There's a lot of promise though, even without federal funding, private donors have supported lots of different uh, research labs. Um, so you just think with, with access to more funding, you know, what, what more we could do. Um, but at really big colleges like Harvard, NYU, even here in the US or in the, in the Midwest, uh, UW-Madison just opened a, a psychedelic um, research center. So, the future is bright. There are lots of psychedelic research labs. We are close on uh, medical legalization for psychedelics, which offer look like they'll offer a lot of uh, ways of healing. There's even um, psychedelic stocks being traded now, and uh, people are patenting psychedelic therapy and psychedelic substances. And um, so it, it seems like this is a wave that is coming. Um, yet we still need to proceed with caution. We don't want to have uh, the backlash that happened in the 60s. Um, with dangerous things happening and um, more kind of crackdown on these substances. So we also need to proceed with cautious optimism. Um, but I think that I agree with, with Stan Groff that it's really exciting time in the world of psychology that psychedelics could offer for psychiatry and psychology um, a tool comparable to the microscope for biology or the telescope for astronomy. All the things that we have still to learn about our own brains um, and our own consciousness, um, this could be a really amazing tool. So just to wrap up, there's a ton of books out there. My class read all of this one. It's a really uh, accessible, easy read um, by Michael Pollan. It was a New York Times bestseller, How to Change Your Mind. So if you wanna just dip your toe in, I recommend that, but there's a lot of really great books on various aspects of drugs, drug policy, history of drugs, um, and psychedelic therapy. Also lots of great websites um, that I recommend checking out. There's a lot of great documentaries out there as well. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, you know, there's lots, lots of resources. And I'm also happy to chat more with you. Um, you can email me, um, czemer at missouriwestern.edu. Um, and if we have some time, I'm, <laughs> Sorry, I took almost the hour, but we I, I'm, I'm willing to stay around for a while here and, and chat too. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen. Hopefully that wasn't uh, too horribly fast. <laughs> I thought it would be shorter than 50 minutes, but it was longer. So I appreciate your thoroughness with it because it seemed like it went too fast for me because I knew nothing about this originally and now I'm like fascinated with it and want to do all this research. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let everybody um, in the chat here or go ahead and unmute yourself if you have questions um, and then I'll check the Facebook while we do that. See if there's any on there. I see on the chat that people are asking about Kratom and I, I'm not familiar with that. I'd have to look that up. But no, it's different from my boga. Yeah, somebody, Zach. Hi, Zach. Mentioned there. Thank you. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the um, the neuroplasticity um, when you are using the the substance. Does that is that something that extends beyond the 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 time that you're using it? That's a great question. Um, 
I don't have a I don't have a good answer. Uh, I would have to look into that more. I, I think that there's there's definitely potential for it. I mean, when you are in the, especially in the days or so directly after that, um, you're still really more open-minded uh, and, and susceptible to, to working on those things and, and suggestion. Um, one interesting thing that's been found is that, you know, our personality, which is measured by the big five of openness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and so on. Um, that's pretty stable throughout our lifespan, but people who have taken psychedelics have an increase in, in the measure of openness. Um, that's measure, a measurable increase. So, so there is some longer lasting change. And, and I don't know if that necessarily correlates with more neuroplasticity from there on, um, but, but just the fact that you may be more open to, to different experiences afterwards. But yeah, that's a great question. And, and we may not even have an answer to that yet. It's something that would be hard to measure, you know, after um, afterwards to continue measuring the neuroplasticity. And um, another question, um, you talked about other methods for achieving kind of a, a, a psychoactive experience, a psychedelic yeah. experience being uh, things like prayer and meditation and fasting. Um, is there any uh, correlation between somebody that uses those methods and effectiveness of psychedelics? Yeah, so um, I think Griffiths did a study with, um, or, or is currently studying meditators, long-term meditators and psychedelics um, to see what exactly sort of that, like if, if you are already practicing these other techniques, does it make you more susceptible less susceptible. Um, and I don't know if, if we have an answer to that yet. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's so much that's still unknown. Um, but I think that's a great question. And, you know, sometimes psychedelics are seen as, as a little bit of a shortcut to the top of the mountain, because, you know, to you have to meditate for a long time and work on that practice or, or work on, you know, the breathing techniques, um, be, be drumming and chanting for hours and hours where you can just take a, a mushroom and sort of get to that same place. Um, but, but there still is a lot of similarities with, with that. And, and for some people, the psychedelic experience opens up that door, um, what Aldous Huxley called the door of perception, and then it may um, inspire them to find that again through other methods um, like fasting, meditation, breath work, things like that. Um, so I don't know if that totally answers your question, but that is something that I would look into the John Hopkins research on that because I know uh, Roland Griffiths is, is a long-term meditator and that's what brought him, what interested him in the field of psychedelics. And so that's really his uh, forte is looking at that intersection. Okay. It's nice to see familiar faces. Hi, friends. <laughs> All right, I didn't see anything on our Facebook Live, um, but if anything comes up and I don't know how to answer that, I will definitely direct them to you um, since I have your contact information if that pops up later. Um, I think it was super great to have you talk today. Um, I do a lot of our tours for the Glore Psychiatric Museum and it's nice to have some updates for people on therapies and like what's coming and what's new in the world of mental health. So I'm glad to have that kind of update for them because Right now, a lot of our stuff ends in the 60s because that's about when they made most of the museum exhibits. So, um, and how we talk about art therapy and like talk therapy and occupational therapy comes from about that time. So it's a oh, lot of, it's a, <laughs> yeah, we have an update. And like I tell people all the time, a lot of the stuff we know now and kind of take for granted um, as far as neuroscience and like simple things like our you know, brain hemispheres control the opposite sides of our bodies weren't really known until like the 1980s. And that blows people's minds all the time. So yeah, well, an interesting fact, the discovery of LSD and the fact that such a tiny, tiny dose had such a traumatic effect on the brain was partially what led to um, the discovery of neurotransmitters in the brain. So serotonin being the first and then dopamine, norepinephrine. So we didn't even really know that there were these tiny little chemicals that were sending messages between the synapse until um, around the same time as the discovery of LSD. It was very uh, instrumental in 
figuring out the way our brains actually work. And then from that, we came up with these drugs like Zoloft and Prozac and the antidepressants that came before that that are acting on those neurotransmitter systems. So it's really, you know, kind of remarkably related this, the whole wave of, of neurochemistry and, and um, trying to alter the way that we think and, and behave and, and respond by altering the chemicals in our brain and has a lot to do with the discovery of these, these psychedelic compounds. Fantastic. Well, are there any more questions here? Um, I don't see any more in the chats other than just great presentation um, and a lot of new information. Definitely going to be checking out some of those sources, like I said, and maybe be in contact with you to beef up my tour of the Glore. Um, <laughs> but other than that, thank you all for joining us today. Um, our next Psychology Social Hour is going to be next month, the last Thursday of the month, um, and it'll be going over suicide prevention. So thank you, Christine. Yeah, thanks all for coming and joining me today. <laughs> thank you.